Hi, I'm Martin Bjergo. Welcome to Pine Tribe's video interview. With us today we have Bill Liao, who I'll get back to in just a second, and Philip Trampe, uh, my colleague here at Pine Tribe. So, as we always do, first a small fact about Scandinavia. And this is actually a great day to do this exercise because we just came out again as, as the world happiest nation, uh, according to World Happiness um, Report. Denmark is the happiest country in the world, again. <laughs> I think that's worth a celebration. <laughs> it is. And uh, number two is Norway, um, our almost yeah, our neighbor country uh, here in Scandinavia. Number three is Switzerland. Um, they have so much cheese, chocolate, good <laughs> things going on. <laughs> and uh, number three, uh, number four is the, the, the Netherlands. They have, you know, free marijuana and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> and a great work-life balance, I should mention, uh, mm -hmm. like we do in Denmark. And then number five is Sweden, the home country of my wife. Uh, so I kind of enjoy seeing that on the list as well. <laughs> so that's a <laughs> small introduction. And... Um, Bill, I was in doubt about how to introduce you. I've known you for, for a couple of years now, and you have been up to and are doing so many things that I think, um, you know, words that pop into my mind is business, businessman, investor, philanthropist, author, speaker, and I guess all of them uh, are true. Um, and at the same time, I feel that maybe, you know, you could, you could do a more convincing uh, short uh, <laughs> story about who you are. Um, I would say that I'm a citizen of Earth. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the the thing that I see more and more is that nationalism is actually a, a bit childish. And uh, we need to, you know, start, start uh, thinking more about how much happiness there is on the whole planet as an average rather than which is the happiest place. <laughs> so while I admire that Denmark is the happiest, maybe it's a good example, um, you know, it's not okay for me that there's an unhappiest place on earth. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's something that I really want to, want, want to work very hard and I am working hard to, to shift so that we have a, a world that works for all living things. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. And um, actually, I, I learned about you the first time when, when I when I read a book that you've written. Uh, and uh, Philip, I know you you just read it recently as well. Mm -hmm. And it's called Stone Soup. Um, do you mind uh, you know sharing with us what's the, you know why you wrote that book and what's the general message in it? So yeah, the 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 world occurs in language, and you know, particularly the human world occurs in language. So everything that we do, everything that, that we end up impacting has its beginning and its end in, in how we speak about it, how we think internally about it, how we share about it. And that means that language has the power to achieve really anything. And Stone Soup is a, a, a folktale about how an impoverished magician you know, causes a shift in a village just through the use of creative language. And when I look around the world, we need more and more powerful ways of expressing the things that need to happen so that people get behind them. And that's what caused me to write the book. Hmm. Yeah, I remember when I visited you in Ireland and, and you allowed me to spend half a day together with you to be inspired from you. Uh, you mentioned this term of uh, or this 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 word a sound bite, <laughs> and gave me a few examples of that. Uh, and I think that that was one thing that I definitely brought home with me: the idea of if you make the right phrase, that that can travel faster than uh, the speed of light, properly, <laughs> or almost as fast. Or oh, uh, at the speed of light, as soon as it's on the radio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and 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 remember one example you gave, and that is because you you're pretty big on on forestation and and the uh, taking initiative to uh, an NGO called We Forest, where you just planted over over five million trees. Congratulations! Thank you. Um, and um, I, I, I saw your YouTube, uh, no, not you, your TED talk around this topic, I think. And you you have this phrase of saying, "Do you want a tree? Do you want a tree with that?" Isn't that yeah. right? <laughs> oh, do you want a tree? Do you want trees with that? Or, or our, our best one so far is buy two, get one tree. 
And in fact, um, you know, there there are several consumer brands that you will see very shortly announcing their their uh, coming onto that buy two get one tree campaign. And the thing to know about that is that the language works really powerfully to assist the companies to actually make a profit while they're doing good, because when they buy two and get one tree, they halve their customer acquisition cost and they tax deduct the bonus item. So that means it's profitable day one. Mm. And the money goes very directly to the people planting the trees, which are village women around the equator who plant them by hand and are paid to look after them and to plant them, but also are trained to, to create food forests that actually will crop year in, year out and provide them with more value than the tree would have as timber or as charcoal. So all the way down the chain, value is created. And yet, all of that occurs in language. Yeah, and, and some hard work probably. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of hard work. Oh. Hard work is inspired by the language you believe in. Mm. Well, yeah. it's just the language that kick-started the whole thing to go. And then you start the win-win-win-win effect. Yeah, and, and, and look at what you just said. Win-win-win-win. Yeah. Each win is, is in language first and last. Right? <laughs> you know, when, you, when, you, when you have a win, if you have a win by yourself alone and you can't tell anyone about it, it just doesn't feel as good. <laughs> No, I see what you're saying. Because you can't share your victory, so who who who's celebrating? Just yourself? exactly. It's it seems awfully self-serving to celebrate it by yourself. <laughs> what, what 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 what? How do we relate to sports then? Because then there's a winner and a loser. Um, is is that a good thing, or is it like something we need to move beyond, or what 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 do? Or is that just a different area of life? Well, I think there's a competitive dynamic in all humans. I think it's kind of hardwired into the genes. Um, at the same time, our DNA is also a form of language, and it's digital. So, you know, where we can take this, who knows? What I can say is that I think that if you ask any competitor at the top of their game, like if you go to the, to, to the Olympics and you, you, you look at the top 10, i don't think any of the top 10 think of themselves as losers at any point during the games. And yes, three of them come home with medals, but I, I would be very surprised to see, you know, number eight saying, oh, I'm a loser. <laughs> hmm. And you would also say maybe in a, in a sports scenario, the person who, let's say, on top with the gold, their win is at other people's loss. So that's how they're comparing it. They're, they're, they may celebrate their win with their supporters or in the Olympics, their country, But it was at somebody else's loss versus when we're talking about Bill's win-win-win scenario, nobody's losing out. Yeah, I mean, both. You know, it's yeah. like you can have winners without losers, and that's the key. But in sport, you know, I don't think that even the losers consider themselves losers, if you see yeah. what I mean. Yeah. yeah. And that's okay. Um, I think it's much better that we compete with sport than we compete with war. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a way to work out the anger right there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Leave it on the field. Leave it on the field. Yeah, I, I think soccer could probably do with more scoring so that the anger is released faster so that, the, <laughs> there, that it is left on the field. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and why did it become uh, forestation that, that has turned into your big passion uh, for the world uh, alongside other passions, of, of, of course? Uh, how did you come up with the idea? Did anyone, any, anything or anyone trigger that? Yeah, I, I mean, actually, it was my daughter who who most triggered that because you know when she, when we were sitting together, we homeschool our kids, and 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 years ago when we were sitting together looking at the data on climate change, she looked up at me and said, "Daddy, you broke the planet. You better fix it." And you know, the more data I looked at at, at climate, you know, I realized that that we have a really big problem, and. One of the issues with language is that you can be always negative and almost all of the literature, all of the promotion, all of the, the, the language around climate was negative. And I realized that actually if you're going to have an impact, you've got to have some positive messages. You've got to give people some hope. And so, you know, my, my new book, Forest, the tagline is reasons to be hopeful. And the reason that trees are so important is because they have this multi-dimensional impact. 
they're a very holistic approach to doing something about climate change. They're not the only solution, but boy, do they do a lot. So, for instance, when you plant a tree, you know, you sequester, if you, if you, you know, rehabilitate degraded land, which has got no carbon in it because all the life is dead, and you reforest that, you store a lot of carbon in the soil, you store a lot of carbon in the tree, and you bring carbon into the, into the food chain again. And so, like every piece of fruit you eat and you, you put the fertilizer back in the soil, you're, you're sequestering more and more carbon. So actually, each tree is about a ton of CO2 that you, you, you actually put back when you do a holistic approach. But then the trees make clouds. They have little bacteria on their leaves that fly up into the atmosphere and seed clouds. And clouds reflect sunlight. So if you can increase cloud cover by 1% to 2% around the equator, you can actually really make a huge impact on global warming because there's many, 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 many more times water in the atmosphere than CO2. Water is measured in whole percentage points. CO2 is measured in parts per million. So if you can change the water cycle, you can have a much bigger, quicker effect. And then trees also offer economic benefit all the way up and down the line, as we, as we just spoke about. It's a win all the way. So really, that's why, because they're such a powerful tool, reforesting has become a big part. It's, in fact, my only uh, tool in the environmental side of things. That positive message, the win-win-win, and actually trees making clouds. Hmm. Okay. So, so your daughter put you up to the <laughs> challenge of fixing the planet, and you thought about it in an analytic way. What is the way I can have most impact? And so came, got, came up with trees. Yeah, well, my daughter put me up to the challenge, but actually I didn't think about it in an analytical way. I went out to my network and I looked for a couple of years for a solution. And everybody was telling me the negative messages and those result in paralysis. And I was looking for, well, what could you do tomorrow that would actually make a difference? And it turns out that planting a tree is the most powerful thing that I could find. If there's something more powerful that I could find, I'd do that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and it's proven very scalable now with the five million trees planted and yep. a, a strong organization. Yeah, very scalable and and very quick, much quicker than people think. You know, you can start, uh, you know, producing actually a good permaculture system within months of starting, and the trees within years. And uh, the other thing is. I get very irritated when people say, oh, look, you know, the environment. We must teach our kids how to look after the environment. And I think that's actually, my daughter had it right. I mean, our generation broke the planet. We should fix it while we still can. You know, we've made the money. We're the richest generation of humans on the planet. Even the poorest are the richest, if you see what I mean, than, than humans have ever been. We should really take that last 40 years of progress and say, right, now time to spend that on fixing what we broke yeah. and not leave it for the kids to fix. Mm -hmm. Fix it for them. That was, that's good parenting, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what does she think about now, your daughter? How, how old is she? She's 14 now. 14. What does she think about daddy's project now? She's pretty proud. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's like, you know, like it's on the way, but she's still like cracking the whip, you know, you've got work. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. good. But there's another movement yeah, that, that, that you initiated called uh, Coda Dojo? Dojo. Coda Dojo. Can, yep. can, um, yeah, do you mind sharing a bit about, uh, about that? Sure. Well, you know, in, to have a world that works for everyone, the first thing you, you need is a world that's still livable. So that's the environment side. But then you also need people to be enlightened. And I believe that language is the pathway to enlightenment. And I believe that exposure to all sorts of languages is really powerful. And computer languages are probably the most powerful languages in, in many areas. And yet, when I started with James Welton, my co-founder, you know, when we started together, Three years ago, we couldn't find any programming courses for primary school kids anywhere. No schools were doing it. There's it only started at a later age? Or? 
Yeah, they only started at college level usually, you know, really? even secondary school. And if you're going to learn a language, you are so much better learning it young. And you have to understand great programming, great code is poetry, right? It's, it, you know, the best coders are poets who play well with others. And why are they poets? Because they have creativity and economy of expression. You know, and that's the definition of poetry, more meaning in fewer words, fewer instructions. And the best code, you can see it, it runs fast, it's smooth, and it does lots of stuff with very little effort. That's fantastic code. Now, to get that good, you need to start six, seven, eight years old. And you need to start in a social way, you know, and we've proven that, you know, if you look around the world for, for 800 years, Karate and uh, Kendo have been taught in dojos. Experientially, you know, uh, collaborative learning and where there's a focus on passing on what you learn. And we looked at that and we realized that nobody was doing that with anything but martial arts. And yet here is a system that predates the Western education system by 400 years and is still operating in every country. How can that be? You know, why don't we leverage that? So, we turned it into Coda Dojo. We now have uh, 360 plus uh, dojos in 39 countries. Each dojo is around 100 kids. So we've got a lot of kids going and we, we're growing all the time. Uh, we just opened up in partnership with the US State Department Coda Dojo in Nigeria and Coda Dojo Tanzania. Um, and uh, with their Lions in Africa initiative, we're actually going to be rolling them out Pan Africa. And also in the future, Pan Asia. Well, we already have Kota dojos uh, in you know most European countries and uh, in twenty eight US states. Uh, there's even Kota dojo in Denmark. It's good to know. And is it only for kids, or can we all join in on this? Um, it, Kota dojo is for kids. Uh, if you want to go to a Kota dojo as an adult, yeah. you, you you know you need to be accompanied by a minor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll see if I can get a hold of one. Because I know I have <laughs> just to go in and learn some coding. <laughs> yeah, that could all go horribly wrong if you. So, <laughs> maybe I'll just I'll force my little brother to go into a dojo and then pass on the information to me dojo style. I think that might be a way to. Could accompany him as as as, <laughs> as a parent of record, no problem. <laughs> there we go. That's the way to do it. And, and and you know it's a fantastic career move for him because yeah. it doesn't matter what career you choose. Being able to code will improve your chances of success because there is no field of human endeavor where novel software cannot make a difference or is not already a dependency. And yet we're out of programmers. You know, uh, the highest dropout levels in, in university and college courses are in computer science. Why? Because it's hard. And unless you've been exposed young, it's really hard. Mm. Can anyone learn it, Bill? Because I, 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 I'm, uh, if I remember correct, you used to be a programmer yourself, right? Yes. Yeah. I've, uh, I, I, well, I'm still a programmer, but I'm not doing it for you know all the time, <laughs> uh, so I'm not very good anymore. And, um, but and I could, if I had to, I could just go back to programming and get good again because once you've got that skill, you can always reactivate it. But if you've never done it before, it's very hard. It's not impossible. But it's like learning a new language when you haven't learned another language before. You know, you, it's hard to get really good. I mean, it's possible, but it's very hard to write poetry in anything but your mother tongue. Mm -hmm. But anyway. as you said, if, if you've learned it before, you can pick it back up if you reimmerse yourself in the culture. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and Bill, I, I remember you told me that, uh, I don't know if it's still the case, but in the beginning, you, 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 uh, you didn't even have a bank account in this uh, organization. Kodo do, uh, Dodo. Um, is that still the case with so many uh, uh, locations, or have um, you had to abandon that? No, no, principle? no. I, I mean, the, the, we have a, a, a couple of foundations that support us um, Sh uh, Sean O'Sullivan Foundation and Hello World Foundation. Uh, but there is no central Coda Dojo bank account. Uh, you know, all of this is self organizing. Um, people do it because they love it and because they see the impact that it has for the kids. The spaces are donated mostly by offices. So, you know, you, you have, uh, like, most offices have a canteen or a boardroom they're not using. 
on a Saturday or a Sunday or after hours. And that uh, is where the Kota Dojos happen. And here's the thing. Kids love going in to see where mum or dad works. They love spending time in office environments. They don't want to spend more time at school. But when you say, hey, come into this office and come into this boardroom, you know, they love it. And uh, I'll give you an example. In, in Oxford, there's this wonderful young girl called Taria. She is 11 years old. She is a hardcore Python developer. And she was a young, young Rewired State champion. And she contacted us and said, I want to start a Coda Dojo. And she sent a, an email. Um, you know, she asked me, well, where, where could I have it? I said, well, what, what businesses are around? She said, well, down the street from us is uh, Natural Motion Games, who make my favorite game, Clumsy Ninja. And I, I did a, a quick LinkedIn search, and I found uh, Torsten Real, the CEO, on, uh, on LinkedIn, and I, I got his email address. I gave it to Taria. She wrote this wonderful email. I mean, you know, 11 years old, and she writes this impassioned email about how, you know, she wants to have all the kids that she knows learning to code. Would they give their uh, studio space for a few hours a week? And, of course, he said yes. <laughs> I mean, what could he say? But <laughs> seriously, he said yes with much enthusiasm. And so uh, on the 29th of this month, the first Kota Dojo championed by an 11-year-old is going to be running for free in Oxford. And all of that cost nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And you told me this as an example that you don't always need to have money to have a big impact. Often you can have a huge impact without even, you know, spending anything on it. Well, think about the impact that this 11-year-old girl is having now in her yeah. life. Right? She's going to be leading the sessions spreading her knowledge of Python programming to a whole raft of kids in Oxford. And all it took was a few well-asked questions and some passion. So what's your answer to the question of if, if it's money that makes the world go around, as a lot of people seem to <laughs> think? <laughs> I think that, you know, money is a tool. And uh, it has benefits and it has hazards. I don't understand why you would have sixty-two billion dollars in a personal fortune. You know, I don't understand why you'd have a billion dollars in a personal fortune. But I also understand that it sucks to be poor. So there's a balance point that people have to work out where how much is is of worth do they need to live comfortably enough so that they are taking care of their own needs that they can then on that comfortable platform do something really amazing because i think we're all after impact right you know mm -hmm. uh, I, i i'm never happier than when something goes right <laughs> you know and it has an impact um i was actually speaking to some people today and uh you know that, that work at a, a at a at a wonderful uh charity where i am a, a trustee called the nominate trust which invests in the UK in uh, enhancing technology for, for social enterprise. And we can't, we, in the discussion, it came up that it's not just enough to be purposeful. You know, it's got to be meaningful and purposeful. But it's also not just enough to be meaningful. You know, I see a lot of people who say, oh, you know, it's, it's got so much meaning what we're doing, but they're actually not doing anything. Mm. <laughs> you know their impact is is zero but they but it's very meaningful and very good right yeah the, um, the idea of doing something is meaningful but they don't execute well on it exactly yeah. and at the same time i see a lot of people people who are very purposeful but without any meaning mm. you know so they, they they're doing their job and you know one of the the the, the women that i was talking to she she was an accountant for a a multinational uh previously and she had plenty of purpose every day and no meaning in her life whatsoever, right? You know, and so switching to working in the in in the charitable sector, she has the purpose of bringing her excellence in accounting to it, and there's a lot of meaning in what she does. Mm -hmm. Bill, in addition to to having a big impact, you're also very good at making money. Um, <laughs> you have been an, a critical part of seven IPOs, and you now partner in a in a huge investment fund. Um, One approach could also be to use your skills in business to make as much money as possible and then give it away for charity. 
or how, how do you where do you see that you are having the most impact when you're doing business and giving the money kind of back to charity or if you are doing something like we forest or Kodo dodo or do you have any ideas around that uh, I, I do I, I think that <clears throat> you've got to look at charity in, in a very specific way you know w w for a long time charity was just about handouts all right and and they don't work you know, okay, if somebody gets hit by a car, yes, you need to help them. But unless they're in that kind of critical need, they don't need help. In fact, if you give someone who doesn't need help a handout, you take away their self-esteem. You actually make them less capable. You know, I, I've been in Africa where farmers lost their businesses because food aid was so regularly dumped there, they couldn't sell their own corn. You know, um, that's a disaster that handout model can be really toxic. So then a lot of people sort of thought, well, we do a hand up model, you know, where we help people to help themselves. Well, here's the problem with that. It can work to some degree, but again, there's an arrogance there. There's like you're implying that somebody needs help, that they're somehow helpless, and that doesn't have them think for themselves. The only thing that I've seen that actually works is a handshake model. And that's actually capitalism, actually. You know, it's where you do a deal with them. So like with We Forest, we're doing a deal with the, the women planting the trees. And they are, you know, absolutely contracted to do the job. And they're grateful for that. They're being paid to do something and they're building their own asset because of that. Mm -hmm. That's actually a mutually beneficial relationship. We win, they win. Win-win. Mm. Kota Dojo, there is a contract. It's not a written contract, but it's an implied contract with the kids and the next generation of kids. At my original Kota Dojo, where it's three years old now, no money's changed hands, but all the mentors now are under the age of 14. And if you go to kotadojo.org, you'll actually see in one of the videos two of the mentors there who are actually just talking to camera and the confidence they have. You can see them inspiring the next generation of kids. That's a contract. That's a win-win. A mm -hmm. So when I look at people who go and make tons and tons and tons of money and then they give it all away, I worry that they're not actually doing something sustainable. Mm -hmm. I think that if you create systems that sustain and perpetuate themselves like businesses, that they transcend the individual ego. I'm sure Kota Dojo and We Forest are going to keep going regardless of what happens to me. And that's a great thing because that's an ongoing impact towards a successful future for us all. And I wish more people would think that way. You know, I don't mind that somebody makes, makes themselves wealthy, but I think that there's a point where the wealth becomes kind of obscene and it's probably too hard to even give it away effectively. Maybe stop before that and actually look at how can you make wealth that self perpetuates. Yeah. yeah. If I could just ask you the the story that you told earlier with um, with the food aid coming in, um, I forget which country it was in in Africa, but it was uh, sorry, where Uganda? Uganda. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that really hit a hit a chord with me, and I feel that you're right. These handouts they don't they don't do much. I mean, sure, it'll help you in the short run, but it can also hurt you in the long run. But a lot of these things are government funded and, you know, other big organizations like that. How can you go into a government system and say with your, your shake, shaking hands model, which is essentially capitalism and imply like impose it in on governments? Is there a way to do that? Um, I, I think it's very hard to impose anything on anyone. Yeah. Um, and uh, the way to do it is through conversations like this being public. Mm -hmm. Because the more people get these simple messages, the more it becomes intolerable for a state to sponsor, you know, the kinds of programs that do long-term harm. You know, there are countries in the world that have famine year after year, more and more aid year after year, and a population increase year after year. Mm -hmm. Something is wrong. But until the general public understand that just giving is actually potentially very harmful, nothing will change. Once it's seen, it can't be unseen. Valid point. Yeah. 
Yeah. And on that note, I think our half hour is up. Um, <laughs> I, I for one, would enjoy talking a lot more <laughs> yeah. about this topic. And hopefully, I love we, talking with you guys. <laughs> hopefully, we get an occasion at a, yeah, uh, at a later time. I'll just say thanks so much, Bill. It was really, uh, really insightful. I already look forward to watching the tape again because <laughs> <laughs> there's so many, so many great uh, pieces of information and and uh, food for thought. So thanks so much for that. Thank you. And um, yeah, have a have a lovely day, everyone. I have one last thing to say. Yes. Go and start a Coda Dojo or plant a tree today. Absolutely. We put some links under the interview also for, for your amazing organizations, Bill. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening.